During the earlier portion of the day, uh, we have been talking about the separate exercise of power and the sharing of power in a governmental structure that was unique when it was originally created. Uh, particularly, we've been talking this morning um, about uh, what some might call unconstitutional actions of the Congress in restraining the executive branch, or at least actions of questionable constitutionality. Uh, in this regard, I was interested in uh, Mr. Davidson uh, categorizing the various things that Congress people do uh, into uh, uh, legislation, oversight, and constituent services. Uh, although he said that a particular problem seldom falls neatly into one of these categories. Uh, this concerned me a bit because uh, fortunately I was sitting next to Harvey Cook who always carries a pocket copy of the Constitution with him. And uh, I borrowed his copy of the Constitution and I found nothing that talked about oversight as has already been uh, elaborately discussed and absolutely nothing about constituent services. And so if I might uh, present a heretical view uh, there is no official authority for either oversight in the sense of supervision of the executive branch and no official authority in the Constitution even for constituent services. And so if you follow this analogy a little bit further, a letter to a department head or an agency employee from a member of Congress has no more official authority or weight than a letter from any other citizen. Now obviously in a practical world, there are certain coercive features that go along with one's tenure as a member of Congress uh, that make that letter at least receive more prompt attention than perhaps the average communications from the citizenry. And this morning we're going to talk about some of the coercive aspects that the Constitution in a sense gives to the Congress because there are some constitutional powers given to the Congress which directly relate to how the executive branch does its job. And that's why uh, this panel today is, this morning at this point, is talking about the appropriations power and the necessary and proper clause. Every citizen knows that a legislature, whether it be city, county, state, or federal, uh, has potentially enormous power over his or her life because the legislature has the authority to make the rules by which lives are lived. In a system of separated powers under a written constitution, we don't normally expect the legislature to have that much authority over the coordinate branches of government. And indeed, the purpose of this conference has been to define that authority. Because in most cases, the written constitution and not the legislative body makes the rules for the other branches. And then these other branches enforce or apply the rules that are made by the legislature for persons outside of government. Well, to a great extent, uh, that's how our Constitution operates in most cases. And it's the Constitution then that determines how the President is chosen, how long he or she serves, and what the powers are. It's the Constitution and not Congress, for example, that determines the tenure of judges or the cases to which judicial power applies. And these are rules that are not changed easily but can only be changed by the people themselves, the ultimate repository of governmental authority in a republic or a democracy uh, through the amending power of the Constitution under Article 5. But today we are discussing uh, two possible exceptions to this principle that it's only the Constitution that provides the rules for the executive and judicial branches. And those exceptions are first the explicit grant to Congress of the power to make laws to carry out the powers of the other two branches, the necessary and proper clause, and second, the implicit grant to Congress of power over federal money, the appropriating power or the spending power. As a practical matter, those of us who follow interbranch politics, and I must say, as Judge Bell intimated in his remarks, as the 72nd Attorney General, as the 75th Attorney General, the 76th, who was here yesterday, has a more close personal involvement on a day-to-day -day basis and it's kind of nice to be able to watch this as a casual observer from the outside. <laughs> but in any event, for those of us who are familiar with Congress's use, or as some have suggested this morning, misuse uh, of power, uh, the appropriations power is one that deserves a great deal of study, as I'm sure it will receive this morning, because we're going to be talking about ways in which that power is properly uh, 
or perhaps not properly used, but there's no question that it is a constitutional power. And so therefore the distinctions become uh, much more exact and precise perhaps than in some of the things that were talked about earlier where authority and power appears to, at least in some instances, be to be created out of whole cloth. Uh, the Bolin Amendment, which was uh, referred to in passing this morning, uh, is probably one of the best known examples of how the appropriations power is used by Congress, by writers or uh, insertions into the appropriations. Uh, the Attorney General yesterday, Dick Thornburg, talked about, again, other ways in which it was used, and that came up this morning again. But there, these are merely the latest in a long series of funding restrictions. The use of the necessary and proper clause is less frequently debated. As a matter of fact, it, it seldom seems to come up, at least in the daily papers. But it is that power that enables Congress to create the executive departments themselves and to prescribe, to a certain extent, their internal procedures. It's this power, for example, that underlies most of the rules of governmental administration that are at least set forth in statute, uh, such things as the Freedom of Information Act or the Advisory Committees Act, which was referred to earlier today. Well, the importance of such rules of administration and their impact or influence on the conduct of the executive branch and the courts should be fairly obvious once we think about it. So we will be discussing this morning the extent to which Congress may properly use these grants of authority in regard to money and procedure to impress its will, not merely upon the substance of the law as it applies to private persons outside of government, but upon the rest of government as it enforces those laws or applies those laws and interprets those laws as well. We have four panelists uh, with distinguished backgrounds and experience, and I'm going to give a very abbrevi abbreviated introduction because if I read all of their accomplishments, we would quickly approach the noon hour and there would be no time for discussion. But our first speaker is the Honorable William Barr, a man that I had the pleasure of working with when, he, when I came to Washington. He worked in the White House and the domestic policy uh, staff there. He has been in pri private practice prior to assuming his present job as the head, assistant attorney general in charge of the Office of Legal Counsel, which as you heard earlier is the law firm that is ready to advise the attorney general as well as the other departments of government when their advice is asked. And he has also been uh, in private practice, as I mentioned. He has been in government in other capacities, uh, including as counsel uh, in the counsel's office and Central Intelligence Agency. He received his BA and MA degrees from Columbia University and attended the George Washington University National Law Center for his legal education. Here is the person who is faced with these questions that I've referred to on a daily basis, Bill Barr. Thank you, General. It is the beginning uh, of wisdom uh, to uh, have knowledge of uh, your own ignorance. And uh, if that's true, uh, then uh, thinking about Congress's use of the appropriations power to control the activities of the other coordinate branches of government uh, is a way to make yourself very wise indeed. Uh, it's a very difficult issue. Uh, the more I've thought about it, the more I've come to appreciate uh, its perplexities. I have uh, reached no firm conclusions myself and have no refined and comprehensive theory uh, to espouse today. But I have concluded uh, that uh, the easy answer is probably not the correct answer. Now the easy answer, at least the one we, we hear advanced most these days, is that the appropriations power is a big power indeed. That it is essentially a freestanding power to allocate and control all the public resources uh, that the government uh, puts to disposal. And it is a power that has almost magical qualities. Congress can do all sorts of things with this power of the purse that it cannot do directly under its enumerated powers. There is an implication that as long as Congress takes action in the form of an appropriations bill, Congress is somehow immunized from other constitutional constraints, or at least can trump 
other constitutional constraints, or at a minimum, that it adds greater weight, this invocation of the Appropriations Clause, that it adds greater weight to Congress's claim that it has power uh, over the other coordinate branches of government. The premise is that because Congress can decide to make no appropriations at all, when it does make appropriations, it can impose any control or restriction it wants on how the money is spent. Congress doesn't have to fund a Department of Justice. But if it does create a Department of Justice and does appropriate money to the Department of Justice, then it can control all the activities of the Department of Justice. It can tell the Solicitor General, you may not use appropriated funds to argue a particular position in the Supreme Court. And if that's true, one would think it could also command its corollary. These funds must be spent to present to the Supreme Court the following argument. Now, I don't think this position is tenable. Just because Congress is acting as the appropriator of funds does not mean that it is immune from other constitutional rules or that it can trump them or even give greater weight to its, its claims. First, let's consider the application of spending decisions on the constitutional rules that deal with individual rights. Suppose Congress appropriates money for a program that gives funds to hospitals. Now let's think of some of the various restrictions, the usual suspects of restrictions and conditions that Congress tries to use in appropriations legislation. First, the direct restriction. Here are the funds for hospitals, provided, however, that no funds can go to a Catholic hospital. I think that's unconstitutional. How about this, the condition. Money may be provided to Catholic hospitals only if they abandon their religious affiliation. Unconstitutional condition. I say that's unconstitutional. And then, perhaps the most subtle of all, Congress casts its action as a refusal to fund. Money shall be spent as follows. And then they list all the hospitals, but the Catholic hospitals aren't on the list. If the criteria used to select what hospitals are on the list or not is an impermissible one under the Constitution, then the fact that it's cast as a refusal to spend is not sufficient to validate that appropriations. Now, shouldn't this also be the case when we encounter the rules that are set forth in the Constitution that deal with separation of powers? Consider the original jurisdiction of the Supreme Court, which is vested in the court by the Constitution. The original jurisdiction extends to suits in which, states, in which a state is a party. Now let's review the, the uh, conditions and restrictions that we commonly see. In a Judiciary Appropriations Bill, Congress says, you can't use any funds to decide cases involving a state as a party. Direct restriction, cast in an as a restriction on appropriated funds. Now, they could cast it as a condition. Funds can only be used if the court refrains from deciding cases involving states as a party or only if the court decides this particular case this way will the funds be available for expenditure by the court. Let's add another one here when we talk about separation of powers. It is Congress's use of restriction to muscle in on the decision, to start making the decisions for the other branches. Funds can only be spent to decide cases in which the court has, uh, where the court has first cleared the decision with one of the judiciary committees. And then finally, the, the fourth and, as I said, the most insidious kind uh, or slippery kind of uh, restriction, it's the breakdown of the object of expenditure into separate categories of activity and then the, selecting, the selected funding of those subsets. So uh, Congress passes an appropriation bill with line items for each area of the court's jurisdiction and then when it comes to those involving states as a party, it lists 49 states. And Rhode Island isn't on it. The criteria by which the list was drawn up is impermissible because it encroaches on the judicial power. 
And that kind of device of selective funding uh, is likewise unconstitutional. Now, it seems to me this analysis also applies to uh, the constitutional powers of the president. Let's look at the pardon power and run through the same four, and I'll do it briefly. Provided, however, that no money for pardons may be spent for anyone who uh, has committed the crime of lying to Congress. Uh, money for the executive, except the salary, is appropriated only if the president refrains from pardoning someone who has lied to Congress. Money can only be spent for pardons if, if the pardon has been previously reviewed and cleared by one of the judiciary committees. And then finally, you can list all the, you can do it through line items, you list all the crimes that you could, you could pardon people for, and lo and behold, the crime that's left off, and there's no money appropriated for it, is the crime of lying to Congress. So from this I conclude that Congress can't use the appropriations power in order to control a presidential power that is beyond its direct control. Now, the last example in, this, in this, these three sets of uh, hypotheticals is, is the most difficult. It's the method of taking an overall object of public expenditure, breaking it down into separate categories of activity, and then making uh, deliberate decisions of funding some of the subset, uh, but not, not the rest of them. Now, sometimes when Congress does this kind of thing, it looks okay. Uh, Congress can say, we're going to spend a million dollars on building post offices. 500,000 has to be spent in Walla Walla, and 500,000 has to be spent in Dubuque. We want two post offices. That looks okay. Uh, and then, on the other hand, they can do this sort of thing, and it doesn't look very good, such as the three examples I gave of this kind of restriction. Now, how do you tell the difference? What is the principle by which you can distinguish where this is a guise to control executive or judicial activity, and when it is really a legitimate uh, funding decision uh, by Congress? Well, could it be an intense test? What is Congress's purpose in subdividing the objects of expenditure and then selectively funding them? Is it trying to control the exercise of constitutional power by the executive or the judiciary? Or is it simply making a bona fide funding decision for resource reasons? Once you get beyond an intent test, it seems to me that you are drawn in either of two directions. And the logic of each leads to fairly drastic conclusions. One uh, approach is the familiar one, that the Appropriations Clause gives Congress unfettered discretion to break down and define all areas of government activity and to determine how much to spend on each activity, including activities involving the enumerated powers of the other branches. So if Congress says, we want 3,000 people negotiating treaties this year with the Soviet Union and no one helping the President make pardon decisions, that's fine. Congress can define the object of expenditure. Now, carried to its logical conclusion, I believe this eviscerates completely the principle of separation of powers in the Constitution. Now, the other approach, it seems to me, that you're drawn toward is a less familiar one, but it has something to be said for it. And it goes something like this. The Appropriations Clause is not an independent power of Congress, uh, an independent source of congressional power. It is not a power clause. It does not confer a freestanding power to control the allocation of government resources. The clause, the appropriations clause, is simply a procedural provision, a requirement that Congress pass a law before you can take money out of the Treasury. The only power logically implied by that procedural requirement is that Congress can control the overall amount of public funds that are drawn from the Treasury. The Appropriations Clause, all it says on its face, is that to get money out of the Treasury and get it into a position where you can spend it, you need a law. Now, the power to set and define objects of public expenditure and to restrict funds only to those specified objects 
That doesn't come out of the appropriations clause. Any such power that Congress has has to come out of one of Congress's enumerated substantive powers, most of which are set forth in Article I, Section 8. So where Congress says that uh, there's going to be an army, and that army is going to consist of one rifle company and 15 F-16 fighters, the only thing the Appropriations Clause does is says that Congress has to to get money from the public treasury to support that, you need an appropriation law. It's the act of giving out the money. But the power, if one exists, to dictate that the scope of the activity is just going to be one rifle company and 15 aircraft has to come from one of these substantive enumerated powers. And if Congress has that power, then it's probably under the power to raise and support armies and to make the rules for the armies. But it doesn't come out of the Appropriations Clause. Now, let me illustrate this by another example. Suppose in the early days of the Republic, all we, had, all we could afford is one Secretary of State. And there are three countries that we're conducting negotiations with. And Congress, in appropriating money for the Secretary of State's operations, says, for negotiations with France, $50,000. For negotiations with the UK, $1. For negotiations with Spain, zero. And under each of those line items, it says, and these funds can only be spent for this activity. Now, Congress may think it has reasons, legitimate reasons, for doing this. They may feel that France, relations with France are a higher priority than relations with the UK or Spain. It, might, it may want to make sure that there are sufficient resources to handle the delicate relations with France and that there's always someone there to answer, answer the mail from Paris. Because Spain is in high priority, we can save money there by simply zeroing it out, that account out. So all the secretary can do, except for one dollar of activity, is handle relations with France. These may be good or bad reasons that Congress has for doing it. But it may be that the Appropriations Clause does not empower Congress to segment the object of negotiating treaties into three different, different subsets and then selectively fund them. The Appropriations Clause means that the only way the Secretary of State can get money is by act of Congress. But the Appropriations Clause does not provide any power to define the activities of, uh, uh, of the President's uh, treaty making uh, power under the Constitution. If Congress has that power, again, it has to come out of its enumerated powers, principally Article I, Section 8. I don't think there is such an enumerated power that Congress has. The choices that Congress is effectively making when it attempts to categorize all the different permutations of, of uh, presidential treaty making activity and then selectively fund them, those decisions, how important are relations with France, what level of activity should we devote to our negotiations with France, those decisions are decisions that the Constitution commits to the President. And so when we hear all these discussions of Congress's weighty role to play in various, in various areas of shared power, such as the foreign relations power, and it starts with something like, we have the power of the purse, that doesn't make sense under this approach. Congress still has to point to a substantive power. The power of the purse is procedural only. Now, this is not to say that Congress doesn't have substantial power uh, to allocate resources. There's a lot of power in Article I, Section 8. Congress can dictate real results in the real world. Congress may, when carrying out enumerated powers, define the output it wants the government to produce 
in the way of goods or services. And it can do so with great specificity. It can say, we want a post office in Walla Walla, Washington, and we want you to spend a million dollars in that post office. Now, the reason it can say that is not because of the Appropriations Clause. The reason it can say that is because one of Congress's specific powers is to provide for post offices. And perhaps the reason it can say, I don't care if you can build it for 900,000. I want you to build it for a million. Maybe that's because of the Commerce Clause. It wants to pump a million dollars into Washington State. Now, the logic of this approach tends to lead to the conclusion that when Congress appropriates money for the constitutional activities of the president or the judiciary, and in the president's case, they would include the power to execute the laws and the power to supervise and manage the executive branch, when it provides those funds, ultimately it only has the power to provide them in lump sum as to those constitutional activities. Let me just close by suggesting a metaphor. The difference between the master-servant relationship and the independent contractor. Did the framers really believe that the Appropriations Clause transformed the relationship between Congress and the other coordinate branches into a relationship of master-servant? That the congressional master directs the activities of the presidential or judicial servant, simply because the money passes from hand to hand. Now, in both kinds of relationships, party one gives money to party two to produce results. And party one specifies the results. And in one relationship, it's an employment contract. And party one can control every jot and tittle of what party two does, because the money passes hand because of the employment relationship. And ultimate responsibility lies only with party one. On the independent contractor model, you give the independent contractor the money to produce results. But the independent contractor is ultimately responsible for producing those results. And there are limits to the extent to which party one can direct and control the activities of party two. And party two is separately responsible as the president is separate, separately responsible under the Constitution. Thank you. A bill you've led us off in this panel here with an imposing intellectual challenge, which I am sure that our uh, next speaker is going to be well able to meet and to discuss from the standpoint of the Congress. Mr. Lewis Fisher has uh, nearly 20 years of service in the Congressional Research Service and is presently the senior specialist in separation of powers. He's written and contributed to many books and publications. He recently received a very prestigious award from the National Academy of Public Administration for his book, Constitutional Dialogues, a graduate of the College of William and Mary, interestingly enough, with a bachelor's degree in chemistry, he turned to political science, where he got his master's and PhD from the New School for Social Research in New York. He has been an adjunct professor at a number of educational institutions, and so now with that background in academic research and practical experience, uh, we look forward to Mr. Fisher uh, perhaps approaching the same issue from a slightly different vantage point. I've been at CRS for 19 years, going on 20, and part of what I've tried to do during that time to make me sensitive to separation of powers is to maintain as many colleagues as I can in the executive branch and in the judiciary, just so I can understand their experiences and how they understand the issues. So I want to thank the Federal Society for, for hosting the conference. I, have uh, in previous conferences known a number of the participants. I've met new people here, and I think that's part of the growth that we all need to talk and have colleagues in other branches. 
Mm, Senator Robb this morning said we're in day two. It's not day novo. Day two puts on me an obligation to have a little bit of continuity with what we said yesterday and what we're going to say today. And I wanted to make a link with the first panel yesterday, uh, particularly statements made by Terry Eastland and Don Elliott, and you'll understand the connection. In 10 minutes or so, I can only make some general comments for those in the audience who would like a little more detail as to what my documentation is. I suggest that there's an article I did uh, last year in the American Journal of International Law. It's in the October 1989 issue, which will give you citations to the comments I make today. I'll start with a very familiar executive legislative clash over the appropriations process. It's a familiar one. You'll have no trouble identifying it. Uh, chief executive wants to pursue certain objectives, but he is denied funds by the legislative body. To circumvent the legislative body, the chief executive goes to foreign governments and to private citizens for financial contributions. What example do you have in mind? You might be thinking of President Reagan wanting to assist the Contras in being blocked by the Bolton Amendment and then going to Saudi Arabia and other sources for financial assistance. The, the example I have in mind is, is much earlier. It takes place in the 1600s, leads to civil war in England, and the loss by Charles I of two assets. Uh, one was his office, <laughs> the other his head. Some historians say that the latter was not that much of an asset. <laughs> uh, the framers, being good historians, were aware of the danger of placing in one source the power to go to war and the power to fund it. And I don't think in the Constitution they provided for separation of powers in any narrow, pure sense, but they did very much provide for separation of the purse and the sword. If there's one threat to individual liberties, it would be that, the Union of the sword and the purse. So we're familiar in the Constitution, the different parts of the power of the purse given to Congress, power of appropriations, revenues, imposts, power to borrow money, coin money, regulate the value thereof. On separation of powers, the framers, as we heard yesterday, and we all know, provided not so much for separation, but for overlapping, checks and balances. Uh, after the draft constitution came out of Philadelphia in 1787, some states and some delegates were very disturbed and agitated at what had happened in Philadelphia, all the, all the mixing of the branches, the mixing of the powers. Three states asked Congress to add to the Constitution an amendment on separation of powers. Uh, 17 were considered, 12 went out to the states, and of course the 10 were picked for the Bill of Rights. One of the amendments that never got out of Congress because it was considered not to have merit was the separation of power amendment, which was taken from the Constitution of Massachusetts and basically said that the legislative body shall never exercise executive and judicial powers. The president shall never exercise legislative and judicial powers. The court shall never exercise legislative and executive powers. And it went nowhere. The framers knew that that kind of crispness, which comes fairly close to what Montu Mont Montesquieu had in mind, was not acceptable from their own experiences. They knew that that was not a device to protect liberty, but one to jeopardize liberty that to make government workable for the branches to protect 
one another, each, each prerogative. There had to be power of self-defense, and that required overlapping, not separation. Peter Strauss today very clearly pointed out one of the anomalies in the Constitution. The Constitution does, and the framers did intend, that the president have unity and responsibility, very, very important. But the Constitution also gives to Congress the power to create the executive branch, to create the departments and agencies. They're, they're creatures of Congress. So what you have is the capacity in Congress, if it wants to, to place certain powers in executive officials who are not controlled by the president. The framers knew that would be a result, could be a result. You may object to it on policy grounds, but it comes out of the necessary and proper clause. There would be limitations on what Congress can do. But early in the 19th century, by the 1820s, we start to get opinions from attorneys general where a president will say to the attorney general, ask, uh, is it okay if I go into a certain department or a certain agency and reverse what an agent has done there in, in terms of a certain claim that that person has, has rendered a judgment on. May I do that? And consistently from 1820s on, attorneys general would tell presidents, no, you have no legal or constitutional right to interfere with that executive judgment. You not only have no legal or constitutional right, but you have no practical right to involve yourself in such matters, I would say micromanagement by the president. You have no business doing that. You have other, much more important responsibilities under the president, such as commander in chief, other duties. And with the picture above me, uh, 1789 in the great debate in the House of Representatives on the removal power, James Madison spoke very, very strongly and eloquently about the need of the president for accountability to have the power to remove executive officials. But Madison at the same time, understanding what had happened in the Continental Congress, recognized that there might be some people in the executive branch, and the person he identified was the comptroller in the Treasury Department, who should not be subject to removal because they exercised quasi-legislative or quasi-judicial powers. So you see from the start, there has been a tension, warning on the one hand, a president to, to have unity and responsibility, and on the other hand, a certain amount of autonomy within the executive branch that is determined by Congress. On separation, not so much between executive and legislative powers and branches, but rather the separation between the purse and the sword, the separation here is, is quite, quite crisp. Federalist 69, Alexander Hamilton, argued uh, that the American president was far less threatening than the King of England, and what Hamilton did was to explain that the power of the King in England extends to the declaring of war and to the raising and regulating of fleets and armies, whereas in the Constitution, as Hamilton pointed out, those powers are given expressly to Congress. Jefferson praised the transfer of the war power, quote, from the executive to the legislative body, from those who are to spend to those who are to pay, Madison, warned against placing the power of command in the power of commander chief, the same power to go to war and to fund it. Madison said those who are to conduct a war cannot in the nature of things be proper or safe judges whether a war ought to be commenced, continued, or concluded. They are barred from the latter functions by a great principle in free government analogous to that which separates the sword from the purse, or the power of executing from the power of enacting laws. At the Philadelphia Convention in 1787, 
George Mason told his colleagues that the purse and the sword ought never to get into the same hands, whether legislative or executive. Uh, Bill Barr has pointed appropriately to a number of restrictions on the appropriations power. It can be abused. It has been abused. Congress cannot, in an appropriation bill, as it tried to do one time, name certain people who could not be receive their salaries. That was considered a bill of attainder and struck down in Lovett. Congress cannot, in an appropriation bill, create a national church. Uh, they cannot interfere with the pardon power, many restrictions on what Congress may do. But my remarks are aimed particularly at the danger of a president wanting to conduct military operations as commander in chief, being denied funds, and attempting to fund those operations by going to sources outside of Congress, which leads us to the Bolin Amendment. I think you can object to the Bolin Amendment if you like on policy grounds. I think the Bolin Amendment was a legitimate and constitutional constraint. If the executive branch felt it was not legitimate, not constitutional, they had several obligations for accountability. One is to warn Congress that if you pass the Bolin Amendment, I'm talking particularly about the October 1984 version, which stayed in effect until October 1986, to warn Congress, if you pass that, if you include that in the bill, I will veto it. And that's generally enough from what you know about the dynamics between the branches, generally enough for Congress to strip it out. If Congress took the dare and kept the bowl amendment in, then the duty on the president is to veto the bill. And you say, well, he can't veto the bill because it's only one part of a large continuing resolution. Well, he can. Uh, Reagan did veto omnibus bills, appropriation bills, supplemental bills, continuing resolutions. And the advantage in such a situation is very much with the president. Congress is going to generally lose that battle on a veto of an omnibus bill. It is also it's more delicate, but if the president were to decide to sign the bill into law, uh, he could, in his signing statement, say that I'm signing this whole bill into law, but I want to indicate that part of it, the Bolin Amendment, is unconstitutional interference with my executive duties, and that was not done either. So nowhere from, at the presidential level, was there any indication of unconstitutionality about the Bolin Amendment? There was never indication within the Justice Department from the Attorney General or from the Office of Legal Counsel. There are both constitutional and policy objections to circumventing the Bolin Amendment by going to outside sources. I think if, if President Reagan had defied the Bolin Amendment by seeking financial or other assistance from foreign governments or private individuals. At a minimum, this would have put the United States in a position of ridicule. The president would basically say, I have some foreign policy objectives. Congress won't give me the money, so I have to go out with a tin cup and get whatever I can from whatever nation is willing to chip in. You remember that part of the contribution came from the, as to what our foreign policy would be, came from the Sultan of Brunei. Last night, Richard Epstein was trying to figure out what might be a low point in government. That, that would be a very good candidate where U.S. foreign policy depends on what the Sultan of Brunei wants to contribute. You may remember that that contribution came from a statutory source, Congress ill-advised, I think, passed legislation in August 1985, giving the State Department authority to solicit humanitarian assistance. And it was on that statutory authority that someone by the name of Mr. Mr. Kenilworth, uh, later going under the name of Elliot Abram, met in London at a park and got some money. So this is the way we were conducting foreign policy. Uh, if, if other, aside from that statutory source for Brunei, had a president decided 
to circumvent a restriction as Boland, I think that would be an impeachable offense. I think the president would be taking a step, which is the most threatening step of all, deciding that he will have both power of the sword and power of the purse. The dispute in Iran-Contra led to the whole question of quid pro quo, what some people call leveraging, namely to tell governments, Saudi Arabia and so forth, please give us some money and uh, you'll get your arms sale and other nations, you'll get your foreign assistance, your economic assistance, quid pro quo. Congress has attempted to place some restrictions. I think what we've seen in the last couple of years is a good amount of cooperation and a good understanding by President Bush that there's a legitimate principle here. So this past year, in 1989, the Foreign Assistance Appropriation Act, there was language designed by David Obey to restrict this practice. It was vetoed by President Bush, who had some concerns about how that would affect the ability of the president and executive officials to communicate with other nations. But Bush, in his uh, veto message, uh, said, I am sensitive to the concerns that have prompted the adoption of Section 582. So there was further negotiation, and there was a compromise found. And in the public law signed November 21, 1989, in the foreign operations appropriation bill uh, with an eye back toward Iran Contra says none of the funds appropriated by this act may be provided to any foreign government or United States person in exchange for that foreign government or person undertaking any action which is if carried out by the United States government and so forth expressly prohibited by a provision of United States law so that if Congress does get around to a prohibiting something by law, such as Boland, uh, that there would be restriction in the future about any effort to circumvent it. Uh, there are other language in this new section 582, which Bush signed into law to respect the prerogatives he has as, as uh, uh, in communicating with other nations. This, this is an effort to, by President Bush and Congress to see what principle is at stake and to design language that would recognize the legitimate needs of both branches. Uh, yesterday, Defense Secretary Cheney talked about the dispute over um, covert operations, uh, Congress warning a 48-hour rule. I think another constructive compromise came out of that between President Bush and Congress. The 48-hour rule uh, notifying the two intelligence committees is not, uh, is not going forward right now. And instead, there is a letter from President Bush, read to you yesterday by Secretary Cheney, saying that in almost every instance, he would notify the intelligence committees ahead of time on any covert operation. And the letter goes on to say that in rare instances, uh, he would delay notification until a few days after the operation took place. Then he said, which I think is very constructive, is that there might be incidents where he does not notify Congress, but in those incidents, he would be operating under his constitutional powers. It was very helpful, because there was dispute in the past that somehow the Intelligence Oversight Act of 1980 allowed the executive branch not to notify Congress at all. Although the statute said timely notice that 10 months, 12 months could go by. So that, I think the Bush administration is now saying that that's not an appropriate reading of the statute. The statute intends prior notice or notice within a few days. And anything beyond that, the president is operating under his reading of the Constitution or maybe prerogative powers. And presidents over the years have used prerogative. That's helpful. Last thing I'll close with is what was talked about yesterday by Steve Ross, the so-called SICA case, the Competition and Contracting Act case that came up in 1984. President Reagan signed it, and in signing it, indi indicated that a provision in there giving the Comptroller General certain powers is unconstitutional. And you heard the details yesterday that uh, the Justice Department wrote a memo 
explaining why it was unconstitutional, and OMB Director Stockman told the agencies not to comply with that provision. Uh, it was said yesterday by Ted Olson that when the case got up to the Supreme Court, it was uh, tossed out on mootness grounds, and that's a fair amount of truth to that, is that Congress at the, uh, that year made a change in SICA, removing some of the objections the Justice Department had. I think it's also true, in addition to mootness, that the Justice Department was getting a beating in the Third Circuit and the Ninth Circuit. Uh, two district opinions in the Third, uh, the Third Circuit affirmed. Bowser versus Sinar came down. The Third Circuit felt it had an obligation to go back and look at it in light of Bowser. Uh, they affirmed again. The Ninth Circuit in the Lear Sigler case came up with even tougher language, sustaining the statute and warning. Reagan that he doesn't have the power to indicate particular provisions which he regards as unconstitutional. Very, very interesting. So I think uh, the Justice Department, in light of those decisions, even though the Supreme Court had granted cert, uh, looked at one other ingredient, and that was uh, the uh, Morrison v. Olson case, which tossed aside the very strict, pure separation of powers from Bowser and from Chadha and instead of adopted much more pragmatic reading. And then I think the Justice Department felt that it was going to lose heavily in the Supreme Court and asked by letter the Supreme Court to dismiss the case, which it did. And just one final note on the SICA. Attorney General Meese talked about that sometimes there are things called coercive aspects. Coercive aspects, sometimes they're not too pleasant. The picture I have in mind is uh, McDuff uh, coming back for revenge and facing Macbeth with their swords out and uh, they have a little bit of conversation but it's not the time for conversation. Uh, there are a few words and then there's a nice phrase, uh, lay on Macduff. The battle is going to start, lay on Macduff. And the lay on Macduff that came out to me on the Sika case is that after the administration said they were not going to implement that part of the statute and the Justice Department indicated that they wouldn't implement it even if a district judge upheld the constitutionality of the statute. Congressman Jack Brooks, with one of these coercive aspects, a uh, very subtle guy, as you know, uh, was successful in having adopted as an amendment to the authorization bill to the Justice Department language, deleting all funds for the Office of Attorney General. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Fisher. We turn now to uh, some academic commentary, or at least comment from the academia. Professor Miller has, uh, <laughs> Professor Miller combines practical experience with academic observation having served as an attorney advisor for the Office of Legal Counsel in the Justice Department, having clerked in the judicial branch at both the Court of Appeals and the Supreme Court level, uh, is, has been associated in private practice, uh, and now, of course, uh, teaches at the, Chicago, at the University of Chicago Law School. He teaches a number of courses in various subjects, but includes separation of powers and federal regulation. We're particularly happy to have him here to give us what might be described as a neutral view uh, from the standpoint of his experience. Professor Miller. Thank you, General Meese. Uh, I guess the scenario that has been driving this session and has kind of been repeated in one form or another uh, several times is the appropriations measure of the sort that Gro Gordon Krovitz uh, described. No money appropriated by this uh, provision shall be used to log contacts with members of Congress, something of that sort, a measure uh, which, in other words, prohibits the executive branch from doing something which it absolutely feels it has the power to do. I'm reminded in this regard of the story of the English lord who gets in the car and tells his chauffeur to drive to the club, disappears, and staggers out of the club three or four hours later, gets in the car and says to his chauffeur, James, drive us off a cliff. We're committing suicide. <laughs> well, 
I imagine that uh, some executive branch officials uh, must sometimes feel like that chauffeur when they encounter uh, subject down to three fairly uh, simple propositions. Um, and I think they capture most, at least, of the intuitions uh, in the area of the appropriations power and when used as a tool of controlling executive discretion. First is that Congress has no more authority uh, to control the executive branch by means of the appropriations power than it would have to control the executive branch under other provisions of the Constitution, uh, a position very similar to what I think Bill Barr was saying. Second, uh, aside from matters such as appointments and impeachments, whatever Congress can do under another provision of the Constitution to control the executive branch, it can also do under the appropriations power. And third, uh, Congress may not use the appropriations power to circumvent other provisions of the Constitution. This has got to be right because uh, Lewis Fisher and Bill Barr both said it, and uh, uh, something they could agree on in this area uh, cannot possibly be false a priori. Well, I want to take the first thesis uh, first. The Congress has no more authority to control the executive branch through an appropriation than it would under another provision of the Constitution. There's a difficulty with this thesis, and that's that there is an appropriation uh, provision of the Constitution. Congress is given the authority to appropriate funds, and uh, at least implicitly, and the president and the executive branch cannot spend funds unless there has been an appropriation. So what does this mean if it doesn't mean that Congress has some type of commission to control the executive branch through the appropriations power? I want to suggest that there are a number of functions that the Appropriations Clause fills that do not involve a freewheeling uh, commission, a roving commission, to control the executive branch. The first is that Congress, I mean, the, the framers simply had to allocate this authority in order to avoid the danger of constitutional controversy and essential uh, breakdown uh, of relations between the branches of government in the future. Uh, one can easily see that if uh, the power had not been explicitly granted to Congress, it was quite possible that the president would assert the inherent authority to draw on the general revenues from the Treasury to fulfill uh, the president's powers either under the Constitution or a statute. Uh, the framers of the Constitution foresaw this and precluded the controversies that might arise by explicitly granting that appropriations power to the Congress, and that was a sensible thing to do. Second, function the appropriations power serves is that it provides a mechanism for uh, regular congressional oversight of the executive. Now, I know that oversight has been abused, and God knows it's being abused today and has been in the past, but nevertheless, I believe that exercise responsibly, oversight is an appropriate congressional uh, uh, action. Now, the appropriations power creates a mechanism for regular oversight. Because the executive cannot spend funds that have not been appropriated, executive branch officials have to go back to Congress repeatedly to get more money. And in that context, I think it's appropriate for uh, members of Congress to ask, what did you do with the money we gave you before? That's oversight, and I think that's appropriate, and the framers wisely uh, created a mechanism for such oversight, uh, at least implicitly, in the Appropriations Clause. Number three, another function of the Appropriations Clause is that it gives Congress a, a power to control, at least roughly, the level of executive branch enforcement or execution of the laws. Say, for example, Congress prohibits insider trading in the stock market. In fact, it's done so. Congress wants to control, in a rough sense, how vigorously the prohibition of insider trading is enforced. It can appropriate more or less funds. And by doing that, it can effectively set the thermostat that controls the heat, as it were, uh, of executive prosecutorial zeal. And I think that's an appropriate action for Congress to take. Most importantly, and something that's not often mentioned, is that the Appropriations Clause, I believe, is designed as a tool of fiscal uh, responsibility. Uh, one could make the argument, of course, that if that was its purpose, it represents one of the most notorious failures of our framers, given the tendency Richard Epstein noted uh, last night of Congress to spend, spend, spend. But nevertheless, I don't think our current uh, failures should be laid at the feet of the framers. They tried, and uh, if they didn't succeed, I think it's our fault, not theirs. How does the appropriations power induce fiscal responsibility? Well, it requires Congress to revisit programs on a regular basis to see if they're working, to see if the level of funding is appropriate, and to compare levels of funding for 
one program with those of another program to get a sense of the overall fiscal shape of the government. It's no accident that the appropriations clause of the Constitution is in the same sentence as the statement of account clause in the Constitution, which requires a regular publication of the government's fiscal books. Obviously, that's intended to induce fiscal responsibility, and I think the appropriations clause was so intended also. Now, these are four good functions that the appropriations clause fills. Does it also provide a roving mandate for Congress to control the actions of the executive branch? I think it does not. In fact, I think such a roving mandate would be entirely inconsistent with the scheme of the Constitution. We should never, never forget that the Article I of the Constitution begins uh, with the statement, uh, the all legislative powers herein granted shall be vested in a Congress. Compare that with Article II. The executive power shall be vested in a president, not all executive powers herein granted shall be vested in a president. I think that language is significant because what it implies is that the framers of the Constitution intended Congress to have only those powers set forth in Article I of the Constitution and not other powers. Obvious reason for that is the concern expressed by the framers, by the authors of the Federalist Papers and so on, about Congress having too much power. The way to control that power is to narrowly limit and circumscribe the powers that Congress can exercise. Only those in Article I and not others. A roving appropriations authority to control the executive branch would circumvent, undermine, indeed vitiate that careful uh, allocation, that laundry list of powers which were given to Congress and make it senseless. And for that reason, I think that the scheme of the Constitution just doesn't permit an interpretation in which Congress can exercise a roving uh, mandate under the Appropriations Clause. By the way, uh, General Meese also mentioned that this panel is on the Necessary and Proper Clause. There's a connection, I think, between the point I just made about the appropriations power and the Necessary and Proper Clause. Why is there a Necessary and Proper Clause uh, with respect to Congress and not with respect to the executive branch? I think it's because the framers of the Constitution understood that Congress only had those authorities set forth explicitly in Article I. And therefore, the framers were worried that they were going to be too restrictive and gave a little bit of an out in case they were too restrictive under the Necessary and Proper Clause. That wasn't necessary with respect to the executive branch because the executive branch, I think rather clearly, uh, has a, a reservoir of inherent authority to take actions not specifically accorded in the Constitution. Uh, so I think the Necessary and Proper Clause must be understood in that light, not as a massive grant of power to Congress, but as an attempt to remedy in some minor way or marginal way a restriction on congressional power. But I want to turn to the second part of my thesis, uh, which is that uh, Congress can use the appropriations power to control the uh, executive branch to the extent it could uh, control such action through other provisions of the Constitution. I don't know whether I'm really in disagreement with Bill Barr here, whether it's a matter of, of semantics. Uh, Bill seemed to be of the opinion that if Congress states something as an appropriations measure, it might be okay if we interpret it as being grounded in some other provision of the Constitution, not the appropriations power. And I certainly don't mean to in endorse the use of appropriations uh, measures uh, like the one uh, which Gordon Krovitz mentioned. I can think of a few more nefarious uh, developments in American government over the past 200 years. But nevertheless, I don't think that we uh, should say that because something represents bad policy, it's unconstitutional, as Judge Breyer reminded us yesterday. I don't think an intent test works here. If any time the, the executive branch takes an action, it involves the expenditure of time by some executive official. Time is compensated in salary. salary salaries are appropriated uh, or are paid pursuant to appropriated funds. So I believe the appropriations power gives Congress the authority, if it wants to exercise it, to control the executive branch, provided, and it's an important proviso, that Congress could use that authority pursuant to some other substantive provision of the Constitution. Last point uh, I think uh, I'd like to make, at least uh, in the initial remarks, is that there are obvious limits on the appropriations power. Uh, again, this is something that uh, Lewis Fisher and Bill Barr agree on, but it's worth uh, maybe categorizing them a little differently uh, than was done before. I would say that uh, there are four situations that are worth 
noting. First is that Congress cannot use an appropriations measure to prohibit the president from doing something that he is constitutionally required to do. So, for example, in the unlikely event that an administrative agency is found to have engaged in intentional discrimination on, in hiring on the basis of race, I believe the president and his subordinates would have an obligation to correct that situation. And if Congress, for some strange reason, were to pass an appropriations measure denying funds to correct the situation, that would be unconstitutional, and the president could correct the situation nonetheless. Second situation is Congress cannot use the appropriations power to deny the president the power uh, to do something that he has the constitutional discretion to do. This is the classic case, for example, of the pardon power. If the president, uh, if the Congress passes a statute, uh, an appropriations measure, no funds shall be used for the purpose of pardoning or granting clemency uh, to any individual uh, in connection with crimes uh, committed uh, in aid of the Nicaraguan Contras, that's unconstitutional, and the president doesn't have to follow that measure. Third situation is that Congress can't use the appropriations power to force the executive branch to do something that it's constitutionally prohibited from doing. Again, the example was made, er made earlier of the Establishment Clause. Congress cannot pass a statute uh, appropriating funds for the construction of Presbyterian churches. Uh, and the president uh, doesn't have to carry out that appropriations measure if one is passed. Finally, uh, Congress cannot use the appropriations power to require the president to do something that the president has discretion or inherent authority not to do. Um, so, for example, if uh, Congress passed a statute saying that uh, we appropriate money for the purpose of the president signing legislation uh, creating federal funding for abortions, I don't think there's anybody, maybe very few, who would say that such a statute would be constitutional. I think these uh, examples are pretty uncontroversial, and they go to illustrate the fact that I, I think the dispute here is not so much over the scope of the appropriations power as over the scope of inherent executive authority. Most people would agree, even in Congress, that the appropriations power may not be used to circumvent or intrude on the president's inherent authority. The question is, what is the scope of that inherent authority? A few uh, years ago, I had the privilege of addressing the Federalist Society on the subject uh, mentioned by Secretary Cheney uh, yesterday. Uh, the War Powers Resolution took the position, I think, congenial to the Federalist Society that the 60-day sunset provision was unconstitutional uh, because it intruded on the president's inherent authority to commit troops to hostilities in foreign countries short of war. That provision is unconstitutional, in my opinion, as written. It would be equally unconstitutional as an appropriations measure. It doesn't have to do with whether it's an appropriations measure or a substantive measure. It has to do with the scope of the president's inherent authority. The inherent authority is debatable. I tend to give it a rather broad reading. Others may disagree. I want to uh, uh, conclude just by reminding you a famous statement of that august figure whose visage uh, uh, looks over us all here in this room, and maybe all of us in the United States, Madison and Federalist 48, said that the legislative department is everywhere extending the sphere of its activity and drawing all power into its impetuous vortex. Isn't that wonderful? They could really write in those days. But uh, the Madison understood that the legislature, while a very beneficent and necessary institution, also posed dangers of uh, uh, accumulating too much power. And I'd just like to ask, is it given that understanding of Madison, an understanding which I think is still appropriate today, notwithstanding the good offices that Congress has served for the past 200 years, is it really sensible to think that the appropriations power gives the Congress a roving mandate to control the executive branch in ways that Congress would not be able to control the executive branch under other provisions of the Constitution? I think not. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Miller. Our final panelist this morning is Professor Kate Stith, who teaches criminal law, criminal procedure, and the fiscal constitution at Yale Law School. Uh, she has also served in the executive branch, having been an assistant United States attorney for several years in New York. She has also served in the judicial branch, likewise being a law clerk uh, at both the Court of Appeals and the Supreme Court levels.
She has published a number of articles and most recently uh, presented a paper entitled The Separation of Powers in the Federal Budget at a conference of the American Bar Association last June. It is a great pleasure to have Professor Stith with us uh, to conclude the four presentations on this subject that we're discussing here at this panel. Yes. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Attorney General. Um, I think we've been dealing with a straw man. Uh, a reference has been made to uh, some sort of prevailing interpretation of the appropriations power, that it gives Congress an omnipresent veto over every conceivable action of the president through the ability to withhold funding. And I actually quote that from a very interesting article by one of our questioners today, uh, Greg Sidak. But I don't know anyone who has that view. We haven't heard it today. And in fact, we've heard very little disagreement about the reach of the appropriations clause of the Constitution. Our disagreement is about the reach of the necessary and proper clause, the other part of our title today. I agree Congress is not constitutionally permitted to accomplish through a uh, funding cutoff that which it couldn't accomplish, at least theoretically, through other legislation. And I'm going to get to the, at least theoretically. Besides disagreeing on what the area is in which Congress may not intrude by appropriation limitations or any other means, I think there's some other subtle disagreements I hear today. One is on the appropriate fora and the appropriate mechanisms for testing the extent of the president's powers not subject to legislative regulation. I submit the courts play a critical role. And I think we also disagree on how important Congress's appropriations power is. I think Congress's power, its exercise of its power over the purse, is fundamental to defining the separation of powers. Not because it expands Congress's legislative authority, but because it's the clearest and purest assertion of legislative authority. Let me briefly go over the points of agreement since Jeff has covered them so thoroughly. The power to appropriate originates not in Article 1, Section 9, but in Article 1, Section 8. The concept of necessary and proper legislation to carry out all powers vested in the government of the United States includes the power to spend public funds on lawful ends. The obvious contribution of the Appropriations Clause, no money may be withdrawn from the Treasury except in consequence of an appropriation made by law. The obvious contribution is to impose a prohibition on the executive. There's no executive power of the purse. If we don't agree that the Appropriations Clause prohibits unauthorized executive augmentation of appropriations, then I don't know where our discourse can begin. The clause would be super superfluous if the president could get around it by transferring funds among appropriation accounts, by selling government goods and services, or by independently raising private funds for government activities. So the power to appropriate is exclusively in Congress. And indeed, the Lovett case, the Bill of Attainder case, and uh, the Will case involving the salaries of judges teach us that the Appropriations Clause does not trump the rest of the Constitution. Congress may not use funding legislation to deny or direct the pardon power of the president or any other exclusive constitutional power of the president. What are these areas of exclusive presidential power? Well, this is where the disagreement is. In several areas, it's been claimed in the conference that Congress has, um, has exceeded its power of the purse by putting certain conditions or limitations on uh, executive spending. But the real issue is whether Congress has exceeded the necessary and proper clause. Does the executive have sole constitutional authority to decide what arguments to take to the Supreme Court? Does the executive have sole constitutional authority to decide what legislation it shall submit to Congress? Um, 
most of the areas of, uh, in which it has been claimed Congress exceeded its power of the purse involve foreign affairs, which is not my particular area of expertise. And uh, I'm going to leave it to others to argue over the specifics. I know that not every constitutional limitation on spend, every, uh, every legislative limitation on spending in foreign affairs is constitutional, but I'll let others tell you what the specifics are. Let me instead address two perplexities, as Bill Barr referred to it, with the concept of an appropriation power that is exclusive but not plenary. One difficulty with this understanding of the power of the purse is that it invites constitutional deadlock. I've said that only Congress may appropriate, but I've also recognized that sometimes Congress must appropriate, or at least may not attach certain conditions to its appropriations. Now what happens if Congress imposes a spending limitation which unconstitutionally interferes with the president's prerogatives. This is, in my view, the separation of powers version of the hypothetical impossibility about the immovable object and the irresistible force. What gives? Congress's exclusive power over the purse or the president's exclusive power in the area under dispute? Um, Greg Sidak, whom I mentioned previously, has proposed that there is a presidential power of excision over unconstitutional appropriation conditions. This is a sophisticated sounding term, but I think what Greg means is that the president should just ignore the constitutional provision he finds offensive. I assume the proposal is that the president accomplished this violation of a statutory provision openly and clearly. Did he say to Congress and the American people, this provision is unconstitutional and I'm going to ignore it? Now I can see the short-term advantage of this approach to the executive. As Greg tells us, the president can't lose. If the dispute gets to the courts, to be sure, they may rule against the president. They may say Congress had the power to put that condition on. But the president's in no worse a position than he would have been had he abided by the condition to begin with. And maybe, Greg says, there will be no judicial resolution because there's no congressional standing to sue. I see a great disadvantage of this approach from the perspective of constitutional legitimacy. Yes, the president should stand up to what he perceives to be unconstitutional legislation. But his major weapon should not be to up the ante by insisting upon constitutional crisis. The president's first weapon, as, uh, as Lou Fisher indicated from another perspective, his first weapon should be the major legislative weapon in his constitutional arsenal, which is his veto. And when that preferred weapon is just too expensive, where, for instance, the provision is in a much needed spending bill, the president's second weapon should be judicial resolution. Now, to be sure, the courts have been reluctant to recognize standing in Congress or in third parties uh, affected by alleged ultra-virus action impinging on foreign affairs. But the courts have had little problem recognizing executive standing. If the president believes a provision of a funding law or any other law is unconstitutional, why shouldn't he go straight for declaratory and injunctive relief? Now, there may arise the extraordinary case where the president decides that fealty to fundamental constitutional values requires immediate spending in excess or in violation of statutory limitations. But even here, he should quickly seek judicial resolution of the underlying constitutional dispute. Where is the virtue in the president violating the statute and then arguing that no court can review the violation. Now, when Congress or others have had standing to bring uh, the president to court, the courts have seldom held that the president's completed action was extra constitutional. They want to find implicit legislative delegation or approval or acquiescence by the Congress. 
especially where the president's disputed actions involve foreign affairs and national security, there is a uh, reluctance with which I am sympathetic to find that the president's actions violated domestic law. To me, however, judicial deference in the wake of completed presidential action does not mean the president should pay heed only to his own vision of the Constitution, waiting for someone to stop him, knowing that probably nobody can. Rather, the judicial deference he enjoys imposes on the president a particular responsibility to avoid constitutional crisis, not to spend in clear violation of a statute with only his own interpretation of the Constitution as authority. When a purportedly immovable object, an offensive spending condition, is in the president's path, he should not respond with irresistible force, acting in violation of the statute. Whenever possible, the president should appeal to the courts to resolve this constitutional deadlock. In the few remaining minutes, let me address another difficulty per or perplexing aspect of the idea of an appropriations power that is exclusively in the legislature, but that is not plenary. If I am right that Congress's power of the purse is not a source of legislative authority, that Congress can't do anything through appropriation limits that it couldn't do otherwise, then why all the funding limitations? <clears throat> why, especially in recent years, does Congress so often resort to conditions on appropriations instead of on direct prohibitions or prescriptions as a way of directing executive action? The answer in part is that funding conditions placed in uh, massive spending bills or even in critical authorization acts um, may uh, be close to veto proof. But I think there's more to it than legislative politics. Money is the essential oil of government. If you can't spend money on it, you can't do it. Hence, when Congress explicitly withholds money for a particular action, neither the president nor the courts can claim, can claim that there was implicit legislative approval or acquiescence or authority or non-preemption or delegation. Congress uses funding limitations because they are red lights. In most instances, it's hard to say you didn't see them or you thought they were green. <clears throat> in conclusion, let me say that unlike these um, straw partisans of congressional power, uh, I don't believe Congress is the only interpreter of its power of the purse. There are constitutional limits on appropriation conditions, and the president has a duty to ensure these aren't transgressed. But I doubt there are many areas in which the president has exclusive constitutional authority. If there were, if Congress often had to defer to the president on how and where to spend money, it would make little sense to put the power of the purse in the legislative branch. Finally, just as Congress is not the sole interpreter of its powers, neither is the president the sole interpreter of his, nor should he seek to be. Thank you very much, Professor Stith. Uh, in the interests of time, uh, we are going to play by American League rules and use only our designated questioners. We have two, and we'll take one question from each. We have Professor Akhil Amar from Yale Law School, and we have Mr. Gregory Sidek, who was already referred to, who practices law with the distinguished firm of Covington Burling. Can we have the designated questioners at the microphones? <coughs> I'll go ahead over here. Okay, I'm, I'm Greg Sidak. Uh, there's a lot to, uh, to ask questions about here. Uh, I would like to, uh, if I may, ask a two-part question. Uh, the first part uh, I would uh, like to address to uh, the panelists on uh, Mr. Mises' left and uh, then the panelists on Mr. Mises' right. Uh, the uh, the, the first question requires a little bit of motivation uh, to, to really un unpack it. Uh, it's been asserted that there is, is not being made the claim that the appropriations power is an omnipresent veto on the president. And I think that it's, uh, it's probably uh, easiest simple, simply to quote uh, 
uh, what the Iran Contra report said, uh, which I might add, uh, uh, Dr. Fisher uh, made quite a contribution to drafting. The appropriations clause was intended to give Congress exclusive control of funds spent by the government and to give the democratically elected representatives of the people an absolute check on executive action requiring expenditures of funds. Now, I consider that language uh, fairly clear that uh, uh, this is a fairly uh, sweeping assertion of power. Uh, with with uh, that uh, premise, let me proceed then to, to ask my uh, specific questions, and that is, if we are talking about a sweeping grant of power to Congress here, uh, one that, uh, as Professor, uh, or, excuse me, Dr. Fisher suggests, could even lead to the impeachment of the president if it were breached. Uh, shouldn't we be able to find some more substantial support uh, in the debates of the Constitution, in the text uh, of the Constitution, uh, and in the history of the period uh, during which uh, the Constitution was drafted? And in particular, I'm, I'm troubled that uh, Dr. Fisher has relied so much on the uh, emphasis on, on uh, George Mason's comment about the person of the sword, because if you look at the sentence immediately preceding that in the debates of the Constitutional Convention, uh, Mason makes clear that he's concerned about usurpations uh, by the legislature on the executive. So it is certainly a two-way street. <coughs> so I would like to uh, uh, ask uh, Professor Stitt and, and Dr. Fisher uh, to uh, tell us how their interpretation of the Appropriations Clause can be grounded in the text, history, and structure of the Constitution uh, so that it is, it is a more plausible uh, uh, theory on the basis of something more than just uh, uh, contemporary uh, political thought. Now, the question I would like to direct to the other two panelists is if, in fact, the Appropriations Clause is not an omnipresent veto uh, on the President, if it's something more like uh, Professor uh, Miller has suggested, uh, a duty on the part of Congress to engage in fiscal accountability and responsibility, uh, then what happens when Congress refuses to appropriate funding for the execution of, a article, of an Article II duty or the exercise of a prerogative textually assigned to the President under Article II? May the President go out and spend funds in the absence of appropriations? And if so, how much? What is the limiting principle on the President's ability to spend in the absence of appropriations. Thank you very much, Mr. Sadek. Uh, in the interest of time, because we have at least one hour's discussion uh, called for in response to those questions, may I ask each of the panelists to be brief? Dr. Fisher? Okay, my, my remarks here and also my writings are not based on contemporary thought, they're based on what the framers said at the time and what the framers understood about the history before them. I did a book in 1975 called Presidential Spending Power, and it's been an interest of mine for a long time. I've never had ever heard uh, at any time the claim that was made in Iran-Contra, namely if Congress cuts off funds, no sweat, we can go out to foreign governments and to private citizens and get whatever we want to accomplish presidential objectives. I've never even heard such a theory floated before. That was a contemporary view, and I think it's a an appalling view, one that the framers would have been shocked by. And I think they were very, very firm at the time, uh, Madison and others, that you could not have a commander-in-chief both execute the armed forces and fund it. That was, that was totally out. That was very, very clear. Uh, Professor Stiff, would you like to add to that? Um, well, I found the second uh, part of the question uh, really more interesting. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, what do you Wish do we could do that in law exams. Congress so. doesn't fund. <laughs> and um, and I, I've tried to suggest that I, I think what you ought to do is veto or go to court. And if you can't do that, you may have to go ahead and spend. Um. Okay. Professor Miller? Well, I'm honored to be referred to as a panelist on General Mises Wright. Um, <laughs> uh, but uh, I think in answer to your question, uh, you do go ahead and spend. The money is there. It can be taken. If the president is constitutionally obligated to take it, he can take it. And I want to briefly express a concern that uh, the president not go too quickly to courts because I think that would intrude the courts too quickly into a process of compromise and uh, conciliation between Congress and the executive branch. Uh, 
the courts are necessary, but I think they are best kept in reserve until there really is truly a constitutional breakdown between the two political branches of government. Mr. Barr. <clears throat> I think there are two parts to the question. Uh, the real hard part uh, is what gives Congress the power to divide what the, the president's constitute, scope of constitutional powers, whatever they may be. We could argue about what is, what is the president's constitutional power. But what gives Congress the right to classify it and then to restrict funds to specific classifications. Where does the power come from to say you can only spend this $1 million on foreign relations and you cannot spend it on intelligence collection or on prosecuting criminals? I think that's, that's the real difficulty uh, of the question of the appropriations clause. The obvious restrictions, uh, the conditions and the offensive direct restrictions are pretty easy to detect. But what gives Congress the power to put that kind of restriction on the, on the use of funds when we're talking about the, con the, the president's constitutional powers? Now, the necessary and proper clause has been adverted to, but I would suggest that another reading of that clause may be this. It, may be ne it is necessary and proper to carry into execution the president's powers to create a Department of State. That carries the president's powers into execution. But what is the source of the power that is asserted by Congress to prevent the president from, uh, to, to restrict the money for that activity to that activity and not permit the president to use some of it to prosecute criminals? That is not necessary and proper to carry into the execution the powers of the president of the United States. And if that power is under the necessary and proper clause, it has to be, Congress has to find a source of its own power that it is, that it is using the necessary and proper clause for. So there may be an argument that if the president finds no appropriated funds uh, to conduct activity, but there's a lot of money sitting over somewhere else that he doesn't, within his constitutional purview, uh, that, that he doesn't want to put to use, he may be able to use those funds. There's an argument along those lines. The other part of the question is uh, the one that really Kate Stith's article is directed to. It's the other edge of the vice, which is, look, not only do we give you the money, and therefore we can, we, you know, we can, that brings with it the, the power to specify each object in however great detail we want to and restrict you to those categories, but you can't get money anywhere else. Now, it may be that the president can't get money anywhere else, but the case hasn't been made for it. That is not what the Appropriations Clause says. The, 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 the pivotal factor in the Constitution is it gave the power to tax to Congress and to coercively take money from the people. And the Appropriations Clause makes sure that the money taken from the people is going to be, you know, the way it's, the, the, the output of that money is going to be controlled by the conjunction of legislative and executive power that, that's involved in passing a law. But the Appropriations Clause does not say that the president can use other sources of, of funds. The president is not the king. And Congress is not the parliament under the new order. Now, uh, a case could, could be made that the president cannot go out and get money, uh, but it's, in my mind, it would not rest on the appropriations clause. It seems to me someone might argue that the president cannot hold property except as property of the United States, and therefore, under Congress's power to control the disposition of property, it can require the president to put it in the treasury thus putting it under Congress's control. That, to me, would be a better argument than trying to extract from the Constitution some general principle that only appropriated money can be spent. Thank you, Bill. Professor Amar. Um, my, my question is uh, mainly for, for Mr. Barr. And I should begin, I guess, in the same spirit of uh, Socratic humility that, that he began his remarks with, because it, it is indeed a, a perplexing set of issues that the panel has brought to to our attention, and uh, as uh, with Mr. Barr, I'm not sure I've gotten uh, to the bottom of them, uh, but, but I am struck, nevertheless, at the unanimity uh, of the panel on, on the basic uh, idea, really, uh, to, to put it bluntly, of, uh, of the, the basic irrelevance of this topic um, to, uh, to, the, to the issues before us, uh, that uh, whatever limitations there are 
uh, on uh, Congress's power really flow from other parts of the Constitution, uh, that uh, the Appropriations Clause is uh, somewhat formal in simply cross-referencing us to other parts of the Constitution. The Necessary and Proper Clause may also cross-reference us to other parts of, of Article I, Section 8. Um, an analogy to the Tenth Amendment comes to mind. Uh, it uh, specifies that there are certain things that uh, the federal government uh, may not do, uh, but to define those limitations, we have to look beyond the Tenth Amendment to um, Article I, Section 8, and other uh, provisions of the Constitution. Now, given that unanimity, um, it seems to me that, uh, that, and that, and the unanimity that what Congress can't do directly um, it is, is extremely problematic to do indirectly through the appropriations. Uh, power. It seems to me that uh, Mr. Barr's examples about uh, uh, lump sum versus uh, uh, more itemized appropriations are a little problematic. I'm not sure that that conclusion follows from those premises that everyone seemed to agree with. What I suggest is that what's doing the work in some of your hypotheticals is basically um, uh, just smuggling into the hypothetical, Congress sort of doing something that's independently unconstitutional because it violates individual rights, but not the present. Let's take the Establishment Clause. You could have Congress violating the Establishment Clause through lump sum, uh, uh, through um, uh, itemized fundings that denied appropriations to Catholic hospitals. Uh, but the same thing could happen symmetrically if there was a lump sum fund and the President uh, refused to allocate the fair share of money to, to Catholic hospitals. So I don't think that the lump sum versus itemized issue really gets to, uh, uh, really follows in any way from the, from the premise that it, it's elsewhere in the Constitution that the limits are to be found. To, just to continue, and then I'd ask Mr. Barr's response, let's now move away from individual rights, which perhaps symmetrically constrain president and and legislature to separation of powers limitations, both Article II and Article III limitations, on what Congress might be able to do. You mentioned original jurisdiction. Um, it's not a, as clear as perhaps you think uh, that there isn't direct power of Congress to limit original jurisdiction over controversies to which states shall be party, um, as I point out in a recent article in the University of Chicago Law Review on Marbury against Madison. The language is very different about states as party have to, and uh, ambassadors. Could you conclude the um, question? Yeah, I'm just going to go through the, the, the... Let's talk about foreign affairs. Um, if we're going to parse carefully the appointments, uh, the appropriations clause, if we're going to say there's no congressional oversight, but see impeachment, uh, which presumes that there will be uh, the, the House acting as a kind of grand jury, um, it, it's not clear that, that there's a foreign affairs power as such in Article II. There is power to receive ambassadors, but that's, that's capable of different readings. It could have a purely ministerial reading that you just have to report to the president at ministerial okay. in the same way the president's commission. Let's take, finally, the, 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 the third hypothetical you offer about um, Congress using appropriations power to condition enforcement of laws. If Congress could generally repeal the law directly, and here's where Jeff Miller's point comes in, what is necessarily impermissible about using the appropriations power to lower the thermostat, as it were. Uh, and if there's a problem, isn't it because there are certain kinds of laws perhaps that Congress can't repeal because they've created vested rights or because there's a retroactivity problem or because general amnesty law might interfere okay, with the president's power? Okay, thank you, Professor. Power, Bill? <laughs> <clears throat> well, I think the, the, again, in a way the question goes to the last answer I gave. Uh, the central problem of the Appropriations Clause is where does Congress get the power to restrict funds when the President is acting on constitutional power? And you can argue all day about what is or is not within the President's constitutional power. And that's why I tried to use examples where most people would say it is the President's power to negotiate treaties or to pardon people, uh, because otherwise you'd, you'd, you'd uh, cloud up the issues. Uh, and. Uh, a lot of your question really had to do with arguing what is and is not presidential power. 